yourself. Um, again, as you're joining us, feel free to type in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from and we will get started. So hello and welcome everyone uh, to our Find Your Ancestors session for today. I'm Katie Soap. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library in Appleton, Wisconsin. We're just south of Green Bay for those not familiar with where Appleton is. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar. We're going to be talking about preserving family photos and heirlooms today. Before we dive into our program though, I have a couple of quick announcements. First, a huge thank you to the friends of the Appleton Public Library for providing funding for our Find Your Ancestors series. It continues um, to bring us amazing speakers every month. We definitely could not do this without their support. For those unfamiliar with our Find Your Ancestors series, this series happens once a month, every month of the year. So definitely check out the handout. I've posted the link um, in the chat and are posted a few times throughout our session today if you haven't had a chance to download it yet. Um, but if you take a look at our handout, you'll be able to see our upcoming programs. So our next Find Your Ancestors series is going to, our session is going to be on Saturday, May 20th at 2 p.m. Central. We're going to learn how to trace Jewish genealogy with Debbie Trotsky Soren of the Jewish Genealogy, Genealogical Society of Illinois. And um, just so you're aware, uh, in the three summer months, so June, July, and August, we switch from Saturdays at 2 p.m. Central to Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. Central. Um, so our June session is going to be Thursday, June 15th with the archive lady, Melissa Barker, who we hosted last year um, for a really great talk. This year, she's going to be talking about how to breathe new life into your boring ancestors. So if you think you have a boring ancestor, you definitely want to mark your calendars for that one and attend. Again, take a look at the handout for those dates and for those registration links. Um, you can also take a look at our events calendar. There's also a link to that in our handout. So you can um, look at all the upcoming presentations and topics and get all those dates in your calendar because I have all of them planned up to the end of the year. We also have a really great opportunity for those local um, to learn about the Fox Lock system. We're going to be doing a walking tour on Thursday, May 18th at 6 p.m. with Christine Williams for, from the Appleton Historical Society. Um, details for that are in the handout. You don't need to register for that program, um, but it is a walking tour um, and all the details are in um, that link on our events calendar. If you don't live in the area or you don't want to do a walking tour, we're also going to have a virtual option of that program available on Wednesday, June 7th at 2 p.m. Central, and we'll be hosting that one on Zoom. Um, so if you are interested in the virtual one, you will need to register for that virtual one. Uh, just a reminder, even if you do register for any of those upcoming programs today, you are going to get a reminder email from Zoom. Um, it's going to happen one week before, one day before, and one hour before the programs. Um, and that gives you the link to join our, our programs. If you've missed any of our past Find Your Ancestor sessions or any of our other library programs that were virtual, definitely feel free to check out our YouTube channel. There is a link to that in the handout as well. Of course, not every presentation is recorded there indefinitely, so be sure to register and attend live if you're able to. If you've missed last month's um, presentation, we had a great one on bounty land and military pensions. It's only available on YouTube for a few more days yet um, before we take it down on Wednesday. So if you didn't get a chance to watch it yet, you definitely want to make time to watch it before Wednesday when we take it down. Uh, we are recording today's session and we will um, have a link to that recording that our email out on Monday to everyone. And a reminder that recording or capturing this presentation in any format without permission from our speaker and the library is prohibited. All the slides in the handout materials are covered by copyright law, so you are welcome to download and or print a copy of the handout for your personal use, but no portion of any material may be photographed, duplicated, or shared in any way without permission from our speaker. We also have closed captioning enabled. If you need it, you're able to push that button at the bottom of your screen. Just be aware it's a live transcript, so it's not going to be 100% accurate. If you have any questions during today's session, you can use the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom of your screen, and we'll take questions at the end. For any library-specific questions, or if you need help navigating any of our library's genealogy and local history databases, definitely feel free to reach out to me. My email address is in the handout, and I also offer one-on-one -on -one sessions via Zoom or in person at the library to help learn about the um, genealogy databases, our local history gene genealogy databases, or if you have just a really tough genealogy question that you're not sure how to tackle it, definitely feel free to reach out to me and um, we can get an appointment scheduled. 
Then finally, at the end of today's session, there's going to be a short survey that's going to pop up from Project Outcome. It's an American Library Association sponsored initiative. If you could just take a minute to fill out the survey, let us know what you thought of today's presentation. We would greatly appreciate it. It's just a quick uh, eight question survey and there is a spot on there to let us know what future topics you might be interested in us covering in the Find Your Ancestors series. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Today we have Angie Newitson. She has been a passionate genealogy, or genealogist for over 30 years and lives in Appleton. She's always learning new things and loves sharing what she's learned with others. And she's presented several other genealogy programs for us that are available on our YouTube channel, including how to research the history of your house, organizing your genealogy, and learning more about um, the different genealogy programs. So definitely feel free to take a look at those and uh, you can enjoy some of her past presentations if you have missed. Today, she's going to be talking about preserving family and mementos. So welcome, Angie. Hi, everyone. I, I love looking at, the, I'm just getting kind of engrossed here, looking at where you're all from and trying to pronounce some of the cities. That's always kind of fun to do. So today, uh, we're going to go over, like Katie said, preserving family photos and mementos. And by mementos, I mean anything, pretty much just about anything that's valuable to you, that has been handed down through the generations that you want to take special care to provide and make sure that it's there for the future generations after you. So we're gonna move on. I'm gonna go through the slide presentation first, and then I'm going to show you some live demonstrations and how to do things. I don't know if I'll get to all of them. I kept thinking of more things. <laughs> I didn't sleep last night. I just kept thinking, oh, I could do this. Or I could do this. Or I could. So I kept going through and adding more things. So I'll get to as many as I can, which means I need to get going here. All right, let's see. Well, there we go. Okay, this first topic we're gonna to go over is photos um, and ways to preserve photos. Okay, there's three different ways, basically. You have scanning and digitally preserving, restoring, you can do that electronically or physically, and then negatives, which is the uh, old fashioned standby. And in my opinion, the best way to uh, preserve photos. Okay, the easiest way to scan photos, especially old ones, and um, I have like a, I don't know if you can see me in the corner here, it's a little, it's pretty, it's pretty sad, right? And this went through a flood at my cousin's house, and she ended up with all these photos and pinned them outside flat, but that's never a good way to do it. So they're all curled up and water damaged. So I took a bunch of them and I scanned them out to a professional service. Uh, mine, I think, was Legacy. And most of them, they'll send you a kit. And it's a little box. It's a kit to pack your photos in. They give you everything you'll need. Uh, the bags, the papers, the little air bubbles to make sure that nothing, you know, goes around in there. And then they'll send them back to you when they're done if, with a link that you can upload them onto your computer. And they also send you back the items that you sent them. Uh, usually there is a charge for them just to send you the package to do this because it costs them money and for the materials and mostly for the mail. Okay, this is a great thing to do if you just don't have the time to do it yourself or you just don't want to do it to yourself. And a lot of them charge by the photo, the slide or the negative, or if you even have an eight millimeter film you want them to redo, they'll do that for you. And uh, you want to make sure definitely that you get some of those things digitized, whether yourself or by someone else, because that film does deteriorate. When you think of all the old movies and how they have to preserve them and you know how they open them up and they're basically just nothing anymore in the tin that they were stored in so you want to make sure that you're on top of that so i'm going to go okay some companies i know are legobox legacybox.com that's what i did okay they do just about everything and uh 25 photos are about 30 dollars. they're pretty quick i got mine back in two and a half weeks I was able to download them or upload them and I was so excited and they did a, a really good job. A couple of the ones uh, they didn't do so well at, all I had to do was say something and they went back and redid them for me and took that charge off. iMemories is another one that does just about everyone and very popular. Okay, they stayed a two week turnaround program and they're about 99 cents per photo, which is pretty, pretty decent. Uh, so you've got hundred photos, it's gonna cost you a hundred dollars. Okay, there's many more on the internet, way too many. For me to mention try them out read their reviews definitely you know and don't forget to check with a local service i know here in town we have a couple of local services that are very good shooting star is one in appleton that i like to use uh, they may cost more but 
you know what, I know where my photos are. They're not that far away. He's a local business. He's probably going to try maybe a little harder because I'm not one box out of 5,000 that he got today. Well, maybe not 5,000. So he's going to try a little bit harder maybe, and I can maybe get him a little bit quicker or go in and talk to him or ask him to tweak some adjustments or something. So by all means, if you have a local business, check them out, support your local businesses as well. Okay, if you do it yourself, if you've got that kind of ambition and time, um, it's, it's going to be the cheapest way to do it. It is extremely time consuming. I scanned every single photo I sent to that company before I sent it to them, just in case something happened. Um, but, you know, it's kind of it's kind of satisfying for me to do that as well. You want to make sure that you have a good scanner. Uh, you want to be able to scan in different DPI or dots per inch. The higher the dots per inch, the better the picture quality. So all new scanners that you buy are going to connect directly to your computer, either by cable or usually by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So very easy to use. Some scanners, if you have negatives, you might want to scan those. Hey, you usually have to buy an add-on feature to scan negatives. A regular scanner will not do it. Kodak makes a pretty decent one. I was researching for about 179. If you have a lot of negatives, you might want to think about doing it yourself because it could get kind of pricey. But you know, you want to make sure that negatives are at, a, it will scan a negative at a minimum of 600 dots per inch and uh, save them to what's called a TIFF file. And you can look that up. It's, it's more of a high resolution file. And if you can manage to get that, it's all the better. And then you're going to want to back up large files to either a portable hard drive or a cloud-based storage like permanent.org or iCloud. Keep in mind that you do have to pay for storage for those. And I, I don't know if it's a one-time I think it's an ongoing payment. You have to do a monthly payment or maybe you can buy a chunk of storage and put it in there. Also keep in mind that if the internet goes down, something happens to the internet, I just lost all my memories. So my theory in, in genealogy is always, always have a hard copy somewhere. Have it on your hard drive, put it somewhere. Okay, many, most scanners have a copier where the cover has a white undersurface. If it doesn't, then you're gonna need to cover the negative with white paper to maintain that contrast. Otherwise, it's not going to come through. You can scan the whole strip of negatives at once, or you can do individual frames, but never, never, never cut apart strip negatives because you can re release an emulsion that's in there. You're also going to be re more likely that you're going to lose them. And sometimes you take pictures in order. So it's a good thing just never to cut them. Okay, how do we store film negatives? If you have negatives, or maybe you even have a disc that you've downloaded or anything that you've got your films in. Heat and humidity are the worst enemies. High humidity allows mold and it'll grow pretty doggone fast. Okay, and improper storage will cause these negatives to deteriorate very fast. How many of you have old negatives? You hold them up and they're almost see-through because a negative is just gone. They were stored, not in a prop. They were stored improperly. Oils from your hand can leave fingerprints and smudges on the negatives. Okay, you want to hold them only by the edges. And I usually wear powder-free, non-latex, not the rubber ones, powder-free or cotton gloves when I'm doing that. Um, acetate becomes brittle and shrinks. It develops bubbles. And if you open up your negatives and you smell an odor, they're starting to deteriorate. You need to act pretty fast on those. So cool, dry storage is the best. You want about 50% humidity and um, I don't know, a stable of at least, you know, or between 60 to 8 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So Attics, garages, basements, not a good option. Closets, as long as it's not entirely on an outside wall or it gets really hot in the summer and very cold in the winter, closets are a good option. So if you have an interior closet, you can store it on the top shelf or even if you put racks in your closet, that is a great way to store your negatives. You know, there's also glass negatives, which are rare, but I know people will have them. Okay, these need to be stored in archival safe sleeves, then vertically in boxes. So just like you would look at recipe cards in a box, that's the way you store these glass negatives and prints. Okay, how do you scan an oversized picture? You want to scan it in sections and then you make sure to overlap the portions. So start with a corner. I usually start with the upper left-hand corner. Don't, you don't have to, you can start either way. Then you import all the images into your computers and you use what's called a stitching app. Adobe Photoshop has this feature as do many other photo programs. Just follow the instructions on the program. It's going to take you time to get it right, but then you're going to be able to stitch that picture together and you'll have it. 
you want to save the finished picture to your computer or jump drive or a separate hard drive or however you like to store those in the cloud. And that way you'll have it. If you have several large documents to scan, then you might want to thinking, you know, think about getting photo stitchers for yourself, which is a program specifically designed rather than maybe just borrowing it from somebody else or downloading it or taking it somewhere. Okay, glass negatives. Uh, many Civil War folders are done on glass negatives. That's how they developed film back then. They didn't have plastic or acetate, you have to remember that. So they used glass. Okay, they are uh, high quality resolution images. They're probably the best type of negatives that we have. The problem is they did not store well. So there's two types. It's called a wet plate or collodion. Okay, they're on really thick glass and they have a gray coating over them, which is supposed to protect them a little bit more. And then there's gelatin, which is a dry plate negative, and they're distinctive because they're very thin, uniform thickness. The collodions might be, uh, you know, go from thin to thick, maybe not so stable, but the gelatin ones are very thin. So you'll definitely know the difference between the two of them. Both very fragile. Okay, what you see behind here is actually the picture of a glass negative. And the fact that it looks like it's about 1800s just from looking at the type of clothing or early 1900s, tells you how well it has preserved this picture. Okay, when you handle them, only handle the edges, otherwise you're gonna damage the emulsion. Okay, and again, stored in an upright dry place. You can get an archival box with dividers, <clears throat> excuse me, please, to keep the negatives separate. Gaylord Archival sells just about every archival thing you could ever want. Uh, they're a little more pricey. You might be able to go to Office Depot, possibly Hobby Lobby, but that's rare that you're gonna find something there. Okay, and these things are heavy. And so because they're heavy, you don't want to store too many in one box because the box will break. Okay, you could make the box yourself, but I just don't recommend that because you need to get a proper box, an archival one that's acid free, and you want to line the bottom of that box with foam to prevent them from breaking. And then you want to insert archival paper. You can get archival tissue paper or blotting paper in between each negative, just so that if it's emulsion coated, none of that emulsion goes on the other one. Okay, from there, we're gonna go, and I'm gonna give you a live photo demonstration on how to straighten out curled photos at the end of this. We're gonna talk about preserving vintage clothing. Uh, I don't have anything that looks like this. Wouldn't it be cool if I did? Okay, so first thing you're gonna do is inspect the clothing. Okay, and I included a guide for that in the handout. I think it's a website. And if you look to the right, you can see that that one is lace on the bottom, but also oh, that lace looks pretty tattered. You wanna check for fading and most importantly, thinning of material. As photo gets older, or clothing gets older, it gets thin and brittle. Look for previous repairs to the garment. Maybe somebody did a sew job, maybe somebody did a quick glue job even. Okay, wear white cotton gloves for very old clothing. White cotton gloves are gonna be your go-to. Check for a care label. Those started after the 1960s. So anything before that, if it doesn't have a care label, you pretty much know, and you can't see where it's ripped off, which you usually can you're pretty much gonna know that that piece of clothing is before the 1960s. Okay, how do you clean uh, before you throw that piece of clothing in the washer, like I did and I wish I wouldn't have, or send it to the cleaners, you gotta make sure that fabric is washable and that it can be subjected to water. Some clothing cannot. Don't take it to a dry cleaner unless the cleaner is specialized in cleaning vintage fabrics. It will get ruined, especially if it's fragile. It'll literally fall apart. The chemicals will just tear it apart. They'll open up the little steam press that they have and it's just gonna be shreds of fabric laying there, so don't. I thought that would be the greatest thing to do and still I started researching. Okay, spot clean with a very gentle dish soap. So nothing really heavy, no degreasing dish soap, just something like palm olive, which is very gentle or one designed for old clothing. You can pick those up too. You don't ever wanna use bleach or a harsh detergent. Okay, and you look for environmentally friendly options because they contain milder ingredients and no chemicals. So that's gonna be safer for it. Don't store it in plastic bags or plastic containers. These things need to breathe. So you're gonna look for cardboard, archival cardboard containers. Don't hang them up, it'll stretch, or sometimes on the shoulder, it will get threadbare and it'll leave crease marks. So it's best to fold them at the waist. And then if you have to fold them again, you fold in from there. Don't wear the clothing unless it's in very good condition. And if you do, use aluminum-free deodorant when wearing it because believe it or not, that will stain, permanently stain the clothing. Okay, you can get our carpal storage clothes and boshkas 
I'm having trouble talking today. Let me take a drink of water. Or you can line a reservoir box with mud. This is just not going well here. There we go. Okay, you can line a regular box with muslin. And you can buy that at any fabric store. Hobby Lobby has tons of it. And Joanne Fabrics. You can also use acid-free tissue paper. That you're probably going to have to order. I have never found it anywhere. Again, monitor the temperature and the humidity. Same thing as for photos, 50% humidity. You want to prevent it from drying out as much as from mold. In fact, I, to me, drying out when it comes to clothing is worse than mold. You could put mothballs or cedar chips, but don't let them touch the clothing. They will damage it. If you're going to use mothballs, be prepared that your clothing is going to smell like that. You'll have to air it outside a little while. Check the storage area every two to three months and refold the items. It seems like a pain, but if it's valuable to you, do it because otherwise you're going to get permanent creasing. How many of you have a wedding dress that you've taken out of the box and it's just got those permanent creases in it? You know, if you've had it professionally stored from a dry cleaner, which is the best way to go with wedding dresses, you know, and then you and then you have to take it back to a cleaner to get the creases out because you can't iron it yourself. Okay, you don't want to stack the clothes one on top of each other. This will definitely make folds. And when you're storing them in a closet, if you've got two or three boxes, store the lightest box on top, heaviest box on the bottom, because these boxes, even though they're, they're archival, they will shrink. You know, they'll get little creases in them, just like if you store boxes down, downstairs with ornaments or something, and the bottom box has that crease on the lid. You want to try not to do that. Okay, don't carpet the storage area. Carpets carry bugs, okay? Best pests, dirt, mold. So if you can find an area without carpeting on the bottom, that is the best. And keep the arms out of light. Complete darkness is the best. Okay, repairing old clothing is tricky. Okay, if it's strong enough but not brittle, you can repair it by hand sewing, right? I do not recommend machine sewing because it can snag or weaken the fabric or just tear it apart. The needle has to be so perfect if you're going to do it by machine. If the fabric is too old and brittle, such as the piece I'm going to show you, you can use fabric adhesive, and we'll go over that. Uh, there's several brands, one which is described as light, so as not to add bulk to the garment, so nothing heavy, not a heavy glue, and some of those are. And be careful when you're fusing any garment with adhesive. Always put a light towel over the garment because you don't want to burn or scratch it. And next thing we're thinking about is jewelry. Okay, have it cleaned. before you Clean it yourself, take it somewhere before you store it. Make sure that you clean it and you check it for damage regularly, especially if you're wearing it. And I encourage you to wear your antique jewelry. Uh, show it off. It was your ancestors. I mean, wear that. It just feels good around your neck or on your finger or even if it's cufflinks. It just, it's just fun to wear it. You want to look for loose stones, especially on rings, worn down prongs, or hidden dirt with a magnifying glass. You'd be amazed what you find. I found a crack in my great-grandmother's heirloom ring. Wouldn't have found it had I not used a magnifying glass. Okay, most jewelers will do this for you for free. They're happy to do it. If there's any damage, have them repair it. Don't try to do it yourself. Because unless you have a gold stash somewhere, you can't add drops of gold to the end. And uh, I'll warn you that having drops of gold added to the prongs is going to be pricey, but it's well worth it. Okay, you can clean them yourself. You want to use a, a mix of mild dish detergent and water. Just find a real soft toothbrush. Okay, hey, gentle, put it on the ring or whatever, the necklace. Let it sit for a few minutes and then rinse it off with clear, cool water and buff it with a soft cloth. All right, and by soft, I mean something maybe flannel or a fleece or something that's, and something that's not going to shed a lot either. Now, you want your jewelry to stop becoming brittle. And yeah, that is a thing. Jewelry actually does become brittle. So you want to oil it with a high quality mineral oil once a year. Okay, sometimes you can purchase cloths that are already that are able to have mineral oil in them and they store it for you. It's another option. You want to apply it with a Q-tip and let it sit for a few hours or better yet, if you've got the time, overnight. Then use the above cleaning solution and a toothbrush to wipe off that oil because you don't want that on there. It'll cake and form a layer. And then finally, again, use that soft cloth to dry it and allow it at least 15 minutes before you store it again. Okay, don't ruin all your previous cleaning work by just tossing it into a jewelry box. Oh, it's clean now, it's great. I'm just gonna throw it back in here. No, that's not a good thing to do. You wanna top, place it on top of a soft pouch or a cloth. And you know, notice that felt is often used in jewelry box. That's a reason because it's soft and it has a preserving quality to it. And you wanna you know, keep it away from other items so it doesn't get chipped or scratched. Scratched is the main thing. 
Again, make sure that area is cool and moderate temperature and don't seal it in a bag or wrap it up, you know, in, in plastic or something. Just like your clothing, jewelry needs to breathe. It needs that oxidation, so you wanna do that. If you store it in a safe deposit box, still do those techniques that we just discussed, okay? It won't breathe as well in a safe deposit box, but at least it will be protected from the elements. Sulfur is gonna be one of the main elements that destroys jewelry. Silver, it can be a blessing and a pain, right? Because it just seems to tarnish overnight. <laughs> you look at it and go, boy, didn't I just tarnish that? You know, just varnish that the other day, wash it off? So there's several ways you can store silver. Anti-tarnish bags are going to be the easiest and you can get them through some jewelers, a few, mostly theirs are just sized for rings or you can purchase them on the internet. What it is, it's, it's a felt that's been treated with a special uh, chemical or a special oil to preserve that silver and keep it from tarnishing as much. It's still gonna tarnish, but not as much. You can store it in a wooden chest with a protective lining, preferably felt, again, the felt, uh, you know, or for flatware, try a flannel flatware case or flannel pouches. I have seen these. My great grandmother had some pearl handled knives. Uh, my sister got them. I wanted to show them, but I couldn't get a hold of them. And it came with a protective felt case. And when I feel the felt, I can feel that there's a little bit of oil or something on it. And that's that was chemical or preservative that was added to keep those knives. And when I open them up, doggone, I never have, I never had to tarnish those knives or varnish those knives. Polish those knives. I'm just not having a good day today, guys. This is not my normal self. Um, polish those knives because they that fabric kept them really polished. Okay, and there's a many commercial cleaners out there, but not all of them are safe. I always say the more chemicals that's in a cleaner, the more dangerous it's going to be. You know, you've seen those TV things where you dip something in and then you pull it up. I don't like those because it eats a little bit of the finish off. As, you know, at the same time it's eating off the tarnish, it's eating off the finish. That's why it's so easy to do. They're pretty strong. I would say if I can't put, put it on my finger, if I can't stick my finger in it, it's not safe to use on any silver. And then you're gonna have old letters and you know, man, you're gonna wanna keep those. So if you can, because probably they're folded, right? And in the envelope, unfold them. Okay, eventually that crease, is going to tear if you leave them in the envelope and there might be writing on there and then you've lost that writing All right and if you've got these old documents or letters you're fortunate you're going to want to make sure that you store them in the right way so that your future generations can look at them definitely purchase archival supplies and store the letter and the envelope together so that you can see the postmark where it came from all right and any other important important information that's on that envelope and from there they go into your archival box. Okay, again, this prevents them from dust, bugs, and decay. And brittleness is the number one decay of letters, not even mold. That's that's still a possibility, but it's more so they get brittle. You've seen old newspapers, they're yellow, they crumble in your hand. They're old, they were not stored properly. Okay, another one that'd be put in a humidity controlled area, no sunlight, no dampness. So again, no attic, no basement, no garage. All right, closet. I'm just going to have to buy a house with bigger closets, people. Okay, and they're stored in the same manner as we talked before with the humidity and the temperature. If you have documents such as a birth certificate or an immigration papers, you store them in the same way as letters. All right, and you'll have to probably can get your best deals online. I like to promote local stores, though, so if you know some place that has them, go there first. Coins, my husband collects coins. He's got some old ones. Okay, do you remember when half dollars were made of silver? I had all those and being a little kid, I thought, you know, if I send this to the bank, they'll store it for him for free and then I can go get it back. Not realizing that if I give those half dollars to the bank, I'm not gonna get the original half dollar back. I just thought they'd give me back the exact money I gave them. So don't put them in the bank like I did when I was five years old. <laughs> all right. Maybe you have the first dollar that your great grandfather ever earned, you know? So here's how we're gonna preserve those. Again, environmentally safe area, and you should know this by heart now, that means humidity, pollution, and tobacco smoke, which is one of the worst things. Clothing for jewelry, for, for anything, it stains and it stains permanently. Okay, and it'll seep into albums, it'll seep into open shelves, it'll seep into closets, smoke just gets everywhere. 
So consistent temperature is a good choice, such as an interior closet. All right, you want to um, have a collection, then you want to keep it together. Okay, if it came in protective folders, good. Leave it there. You're fortunate. If it doesn't, you're going to have to get some. You don't want to handle coins like pocket change. Leave them in their casing. Even when you're viewing them, leave them in their casing. You don't need to take them out and look at them. Store coins in archival plastic covers, or they're called flips, okay, which encases the entire coin. It's a little plastic case, and it encases the entire coin. Avoid, avoid PVC sleeves. They're cheap, they don't last, and they speed up a deterioration because they're not a good seal. Use Mylar sleeves instead. They're much better. Okay, hang on a second. I'm gonna take another drink, and you should be drinking too. Okay, don't clean your coins. Yeah, it's great to have that shiny coin, but you know, the damage you do to a coin is irreversible. You can't, you can't redo it. You know, and if you really have to clean that coin because you just don't know what it is, then use a mixture of distilled water mixed with mild dishwashing detergent, usually 50-50 solution. Right, handle the coins by the edge, rinse with distilled water when you're all done, then rinse with distilled water again and air dry. Okay, um, I looked up littletoncoin.com or again, Gaylord Archival, or even eBay is another option to find supplies to store coins. And look up the word flips, coin flips, with the flips in parentheses. And here I've got a picture of coin flips. On the right, you can see the mylar sleeves on the top. So it's cardboard, and then the coin is encased in a mylar sleeve. You slip it in, and it seals pretty good. On the bottom are the more commonly known coin flips. Those are plastic. I actually have some of those that my kids use. They look like what you would store a baseball card in. Pretty similar, only they're smaller. And the nice one about those on the right is that on the left-hand side, it gives you a little space that you can slide something in so that you can mark down the information about that coin, possibly whose it was, how you got it, anything you want. So these are a great idea. And I found both of these on eBay. Okay, paper money storage sleeves. They look like a photo album. The difference is they are acid free. So they're going to protect that paper money. You know, if you have Confederate money, something or really a really old rare or even money you collected on a trip that you want to save. This is the way to do it. You can see the holes on the left-hand side that can be stored in a binder. But uh, just because they're stored in a binder doesn't mean that you should leave them out in the open or on a shelf. You still should put them safely in a closet. All right, that's the end of this part of the presentation. Now we're gonna to go to the actual demonstration. I've got my email there, so I'm gonna talk for just a couple minutes. You can write that down because if you have any questions about supplies or any of the things I'm gonna talk about today that maybe I didn't include in the PowerPoint presentation, that way you can email me and ask me about it. And then I'm gonna switch this over here. Let's see, unstop share, there we go. Okay, and then Katie's gonna come back on. Probably she's going to let me know if you can't see things. So I'm going to turn this around. Boy, I've got a lot of stuff here to show you. And now you're seeing I don't see anything, Angie. There, now you do, right? Okay, so let's move this right in front of this one first. Got to go behind here. All right. Yeah, I'm probably going to be cut off, and that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. I might look like that way. Right. So this is just a regular plastic container. Um, it has the handles on the side. You could use a Tupperware container if it's big enough. You know, any, any plastic container, anything that's going to seal well is what you want to use. Now, I just took a normal baking rack like this, and I put it in there. And if I swish this a little bit, you can see there's water on the bottom of it. You can put water in there. I would only put about an inch. And there is a great link to a video that I included with this that will show you how to do this step by step but I wanted to show you. So I've got two very curled up pictures. I put them on top of the rack. I'm gonna place this over. All right, and we're gonna take a look at this at the end because it doesn't take too long. So I sealed it up. Wanna make sure that I don't seal it too long because condensation can form and drip down on the picture and actually ruin it. So I don't want it to get, to get ruined and actually the condensation will form on the sides. Now, I already did one of these before. So I'm going to show you what that looked like. You can see over here that this is heavy. 
So I put that on top of it. What I did after I took it out is I took just some parchment paper here. You can also take some acid-free paper. And I took the photo. Oh, photo's not in there. I took the photo, but that's what I would have done. It's taken the photo. Oh, that's because it's right here. Hold on. Uh, here it is. Okay, I took the photo and I put it between. I've got the parchment paper here. After the photo comes out of here, I place it on top of the parchment paper and I purchased something called blotting paper. Now, I kind of goofed up when I ordered this. I didn't look at the size and it's really tiny, as you can see. So uh, you want to get bigger, but just taking this, I'm just going to use this anyways, taking this blotting paper and putting it on top of the photo. All right, and that's what this is going to do is it's going to block any excess moisture that comes out of the photo and keep that from ruining the photo. Now, as I take this, I would take this and then I'm going to take that paper and fold it over. You would buy, I would recommend buying blotting paper in bigger strips and then take that heavy item that you have and place it back on top of it again. So then you take it, I, if you have a dictionary and you still have a dictionary enough or any heavy book, do that, use that and leave it there for two weeks. If you leave it there just for a couple of days and you take that photo out, the photo will curl up again. You have to leave it go for a couple of weeks. You can put as many photos in here as you'd like. I'm just going to move this a little bit here. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. As many photos in here as you'd like, as long as they don't touch each other. So you've noticed I put one over here and I put one way back here. I could have went one, two, three, four. Just have one photo to do. Just use a tiny little thing. Make sure that the water never touches the rack. Right, there should be about that much space, maybe half inch of space between the rack and the water. The more water that's in there, the more chance for condensation. So you want to avoid that. Make sure that you don't put too much water in. But it's not, you know, it's not hard to do. It's easier than you think. And it's funny how quickly this works. I did it the other day and within an hour that photo was flat. So we'll see exactly where this is at at the end of the presentation. All right, and then this, after two weeks, and this is one of the ones that I did, let me take this out. And then after two weeks, I'd take this off. I'd take off the blotting paper. I don't recommend using it again. It's not that expensive. Just toss it. I mean, you know, if you're trying to save money, I, this is not the place to save money. I would not do it. And this is what the photo looks like. All right. It's nice. It's actually my dad. It's First Communion. It's flat. Okay. It does have a little tear in it. I'm not going to try to repair that with tape. That will ruin the adhesive, will ruin the photo just like those old sticky photo books that you had years ago, that, that adhesive. And that's what happened on the back of this. I'm gonna hold it up. You can see, if I tilt it there, how that adhesive started to eat away at the corner of that. So you probably have some of those photo books around. The best way to get those photos out of there is to use a putty knife or a oil, what you do for oil painting. You can get an oil, a palette knife, or demo cloth. If I'm using a palette knife, I'm going to take that palette knife. Here's my thing, and I'm going to slide it under, and I'm going to start at the corner, and I'm just going to work that palette knife all the way around the photo, and you'll feel that release, that sticky album cover is going to release from the back of it, little by little, ever so slow. All right, if it's, if it's resisting, then just go slower. Take a little time, let it sit, go back at it again. Or if I took dental floss, I would take the floss underneath it and I would pull, I'd start at the top and I would just kind of wiggle that dental floss underneath the photo to release it from that album. And you want to get those out of there. They were a great idea because they held the photo in place, but in the end, not such a great idea because what they did was damage the photo. That ink and that glue that they used has toxins in it and chemicals that started to seep through the photos from the bottom and it destroys the pictures. And I have a couple of pictures that were destroyed by that. So get at those photos ASAP and make sure that you take care of them. Now, when this photo is all done, this is how they all came to me from my cousin, just in a bag, just all, you can kind of see it, they're all in there, all mixed up, you know, and they're all curled up because even though they pinned them after the flood, they just put them in a bag. 
So, and, and you know, that's fine because they didn't know any better. They curled up again, so it didn't really work. So this is what you want to get. I'm going to hold this up in front. All right, I ordered this online. Let's see if we can get the glare off of that. There you go. You can see on there, and I don't know if you have to read that backwards because I'm reading it backwards. Maybe you don't. Uh, you can see on there that it says it's an archival photography album. That means that anything I put in here is going to be taken care of on acid-free paper. This I ordered off the internet. I could not find this anywhere in town, and I looked. Again, I did not look through a local photo supplier, and I know there's one downtown here in Apple Creek, and I think you would have had it. Pretty much looks the same as a regular photo album. All right, it's got the covers in it. It's got the sleeves. There's a little space there for me to write things on the side. I love this, All right? If I have a bigger photo, you know, well, what if I have an eight by 10? Then this piece right here that I'm moving my finger back and forth, I would just gently, again, with a spatula or a, or a metal spatula or something, a nail file, maybe even release that part from pick that plastic up and then it'll make it bigger. You can also buy ones that do store eight by tens, but most of us don't have eight by 10 photos when we're storing them. We have the normal four by six or even five by seven. All right, so that's photo storage. Let's let this sit and we'll come back to it, All right? This next thing I'm gonna show you as I, oh, as I drop my computer on the floor, just hang on here. Should we call? All that technical difficulties, Katie? Maybe? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a technical I difficulty. I think so. You know, we were talking about gone are the days when I could be live and in person, and then, you know, you'd get to see this um, right at right at the library, and somebody would be filming me, so I wouldn't have to worry about it. But those days are kind of, kind of gone. All right, I'm going to set that there. Okay, so I've got some jewelry here. Silver. This is actually silver. Okay, I'm going to show you something that's going to kind of freak you out a little bit. You can buy a commercial silver cleaner or brass cleaner or jewelry cleaner, like I mentioned, and uh, that's great. And they do a job or, and don't laugh now, this is ketchup. All right, I'm gonna take ketchup. I'm just gonna put it on here. Okay, and I'm gonna put it on the bottom. This thing's kinda, kinda grungy. Okay, and I'm just gonna let it sit. I'm gonna let this sit in here. Nah, a couple minutes, maybe. Ketchup is cheap. It doesn't have any chemicals in it. It shouldn't. And I buy doesn't. I have my mother, my grandmother's brass watering can. I am in love with this thing. Holding it up, you can kind of see the tarnish there at the top, right around there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some ketchup and I'm going to put that on top there. Okay, I'm just going to let it sit on. The funny thing is, the minute I do that, I'm automatically seeing the change. It is amazing. Okay, you can put the ketchup on with your finger or with a cloth. I just find it easier to do the brush. So I'm gonna let that sit for just a second. Now this doesn't mean that you can't use a commercial cleaner. It's just that I find the pastes are, whoa, that ketchup is strong. Um, I find that the pastes are, are gritty and I just don't like working with them. They get under my fingernails, they get on my fingers. I can never entirely get them off. I have to buff like crazy. I like this better. I read about it and I laughed and I thought, yeah, ketchup? Yeah, right, that's really gonna work. And then, you know, my curiosity got the better of me and I thought, well, you know, I think I'm gonna try that. So I'm gonna take it off here first. What I'm gonna do is just wipe this off. All right, oh my gosh, what a difference. Okay, now as I hold this up, hopefully you look at the top, which is this dark here, and you see what I just did right there. Look at the difference. You can even see it right around the edge here. A ketchup really did take off the tarnish on the brass or the copper. This is copper. Yeah, people no, are wondering what brand of ketchup you buy, Angie. What? Is it organic? Uh, no, it's it's by Hunts, I think, and it's all natural. It's called a thick paste ketchup, so it's all natural. There's a couple different brands out there. That one happened to be the one on sale, so that was, that was the brand I bought. But I've done it actually with um, other ketchups too, and it just works really well. Okay, I'm gonna wipe her off here. I wonder if some ketchups, I think some ketchups do have some chemicals. If you, you definitely wanna check your ingredients on the back of the ketchup bottle before you, you buy it, make sure there's no chemicals in it. Yeah, Katie, I can't, that's a great point and I can't stress that enough. So as I'm wiping this off here, it is really, 
doing a great job. And you said that is copper, right? Because somebody asked if, if you use ketchup yep. for copper. Yep, that was copper. That watering can was copper. This is silver. Okay, and I want to make sure if I hold it up, I might not get all the ketchup on. And you can leave this on for quite a while and it doesn't do any damage because I did it and forgot about it and came back and it was still okay. I'm just going to put this over here. All right, and now if you take a look at this, this little guy shined up. He shined up pretty good. If you look right here in the front, compared to the back, you see how grungy that is? Right back here. And then you look at the front. And you notice I didn't have to leave that on there very long. Okay, I've used it on brass. I have not used it on gold. I don't know. If you want to experiment with that, that's fine. Someone's uh, wondering about a silver plate. Can you use it on silver plate? I did. I used it on a silver at the high school that I coach at. We have some very old trophies, and they're made out of silver, which would be the equivalent to a silver plate, and I used it on there. It worked. And I looked it up because I thought, yeah, but is it going to harm it? And uh, all the sources I looked up said it was 100% safe. Safer, actually, than dipping it or using a commercial chemical. Yeah, someone said so, it must be the vinegar, which is a weak acid in ketchup that's reacting yeah. and, and cleaning it. So how interesting that we have a little science uh, in our presentation today. <laughs> you know you know what? And you're all going to run to your refrigerator cupboard and get your ketchup out, aren't you? You're all going to run there and get your ketchup out and try to polish something. I know you are. Yeah. All right, I'm going to set that one down here and uh, put my ketchup ketchupy thing down. We'll put this off to the side. Okay, another way that you can do I have my great grandmother's rings. Okay, I'll show you right way, wrong way. So this is my great grandmother's ring. Okay, hold it up and you can see it. It's actually quite lovely. Okay, this was her engagement ring. Uh, not a real ruby. We sent it out to have it cleaned, and the place we sent it to swapped out the real ruby and put a fake one in. You got to be careful about stuff like that. So this I got from a jeweler store. Okay, this is. I'm not advertising. They're out of business, so I couldn't advertise them for them if I wanted to. That's what it looks like. And on the inside is this gray. This is a treated belt. All right. You just put this in here. Okay. And you rub it. Kind of give it a good rub. However long you want, you take it out. And then this blue part is the buffing cloth. So now I'm going to take it out and I'm going to buff it. Now this was pretty clean to begin with, so you're not going to notice that much of a change. But it does sparkle just a little bit more. You can see that just a little bit more. It's sparkling there. How do I store this now? And these you can pick up at a jewelry store. You can, again, you can pick them up online. And you might even be able to get a polishing cloth at Walmart. You know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a thing. I think you probably could go in the jewelry section or, or somewhere, the jewelry cleaner area and get a, get a cloth from them. Right, now here's the wrong way to store jewelry. You can see how this is just all thrown in here and I did this because I wanted to show you. This, however, for storing, this is felt lined for storing my rings. You can find something like this. That's perfect. That is the perfect way to do it. They are encased. This wooden box is lined with felt. It's gonna allow the air to flow. The jewelry is able to breathe. I store this upstairs in my dresser. So it's out of the heat, out of the humidity. Right, and just cover it, and it's great. It's good to go. All right, let's leave that there. What if you have crystal? Oh, I almost dipped my hair in the ketchup. Who knows? Maybe ketchup cleans hair too. I don't know. All right. So, how do I store crystal? Number one mistake people do when storing crystal or storing glasses, like that. This. Your rim is not made to hold the weight of the glass. You will wear it down. And glass, believe it or not, is a continuously moving substance. If you go into a house that's usually 100 years old or older and you go to the little, little pane windows like I have here and you look at the window, you notice it's thinner in the middle than it is on the side. So here's the, here's the window. Here's the edges of it. It's going to be thin here, thick here, because glass is continuously moving. It takes years for that to happen, but it does move. So if the glass is moving, this is not safe. This was meant for your lips, not to sit down. So how do I store crystal that maybe I don't use? Okay, I have some mineral oil here. All right, and it doesn't have to be any special mineral oil. It can be just something that, you know, you get off the shelf. And where are you going to find mineral oil? Probably in the same aisle as uh, beauty products, possibly, or headaches, 
look close to the alcohol, denatured alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, it's going to be somewhere in that in that area. And if you ask a clerk, they'll just look at you like you're batty because they don't have a clue where it's stored. So you have to research your own. So I'm going to take this mineral oil and I'm going to rub it on the glass. Okay, just very lightly. All right, and this is lead crystal. I'm just going to rub it on there. Okay, and I would rub the inside too. Right now I'm going to let this sit. You know, generally I would let this sit maybe for half an hour or so. Leave it go. Okay, and then when I'm done, I'm going to take this. Let's say it's been 15 minutes. Oh, the magic of camera. It's been 15 minutes. I'm going to rub this off. I am not going to wash it. I'm not going to wash it. I want to leave that thin oil coating on there so I didn't rub real hard. Okay, so I'm leaving that thin oil coating on. And now I am going to store it in a cabinet. I have a china cabinet over there like this, upright. Is it going to collect dust? Yeah, it's going to get dust on it. Is that okay? Absolutely. You know, I don't want it like this. I want it like this. It's got to breathe. Okay. And if this base was made to hold the glass, that's the purpose of the space. And that's the way you want to store these. All right. Ooh, a little smudge on there. All right. So we're just going to set that off to the side. Okay. Someone's I wondering have... if that is Princess House Crystal. It is. It is. Good, Good eyes. eye. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty old Princess House Crystal, but it's the one that I had more available. All right, this is what they call, it's kind of a glass, and I think that it's similar to carnival glass. I forget what it's called. This was my great-grandmother's. Okay, I would do the same thing. Again, I would store it with oil, make sure that it is. Every time, and you know, people say, well, don't handle it. No, the oil from your fingers, use your crystal. The oil from your fingers is good for that glass. Actually, you're, you're just passing that oil on. Same thing as oil. And I only recommend this if you don't use it that often. Okay, but again, that would be something that I would do with this. Now, however, if you have a plate, this is also my great grand or my great aunt's, and this came from Germany, and it's gold plated. Okay, so it looks like this. All right, in the back. This I would not oil. The best thing you can do with your plates is just to keep them clean, keep them someplace where they're not going to dry out. All right, so again, don't store your stuff in the attic. Don't keep it in the basement. Not that mold is actually going to get to something like this. That's probably not a problem. The more so with this, that's going to dry out. Keep it safe. You have a china cabinet out of the sun. Best place to keep this humidity control. That's the best thing you can do for something like this. All right. If I'm going to store this, I store mine like that. That's okay to do. Okay. Normally, maybe I would put a piece of tissue paper in between them. All right. So no scratching of course, but just for today, I'm just going to set that on there like that. But I would have a piece of tissue paper underneath. And that goes with any, if you're storing mom or grandma's china, when you put that away for the season or whatever, make sure you get that piece of tissue paper in between there. Protect those because they'll start to scratch. Again, helps it from getting brittle. Maybe I have an old toy like this I want to preserve, right? Oh gosh, some of the stuff rubbed off in the bottom. I know, I'll paint it. No, no, you won't paint it. You leave it exactly as it is. That's part of the vintage. If you paint it, you damage the value. All right, so just leave it like it is. And this you can pretty much display anywhere but someplace that's moldy. It's not going to dry out. However, you got to think of the surface. If it's metal, okay, that's going to, that would be more susceptible to wetness and mold and not dryness. You know, if it's a plate, just the opposite. You got to watch out to make sure it doesn't, it's not brittle and it doesn't dry out. I also have the lunchbox I had when I was little. All right, we got Mary Poppins here. Okay, same thing again. You can see that it's it's rusty. This is actually reproduction of what I had. My mom threw mine out, but it's rusty on the edges here. Okay, if I open it up, it's pretty rusty inside. Do I want to repaint that? No, I'm leaving it exactly the way it is. I do have the thermos, it's just not in here. So, you know, because if you paint it, you damage it. Can I clean it? Yes. All right, and I left this like this on purpose for today. You can see it looks a little bit dingy on the top. You can see that it, it could use a good cleaning. Yeah, again, I'm going to use a very mild dish soap and uh, rinse it off. I'm not going to use any chemicals or anything. There's a little bit of tape on here. Just going to let that soak with the dish soap. If that doesn't work, I might try some Gooby Gone because that stuff is pretty safe. But I always tell people instead of Gooby Gone, you know what? Just use oil. 
puts again, put some mineral oil on there or put some even baby oil and just let it sit and peel it off. Just always making sure that you're using the least amount of chemicals on a product that you can. All right, now without tipping over my computer, let's see if I can do this. All right, I have it on a TV table and that's probably why it's tipping over so much. We're gonna drag it over here. There we go. When my husband redid my closet, God bless him, I, I just wanted him to do that for me upstairs. And we have a, a house that's a hundred years old. It was one of the first kit homes in Appleton. Uh, it's a tiny one, but this was in the closet. All right, he found this between the closet walls. This is, I can hold it up here maybe. You can see it more. This is a 1920 dress. All right, remember when I said I threw it in the washer? Look what happened. That fabric was so old and so brittle that even on the gentle cycle, it just disintegrated. And did that really get the stains out? No. So was that a good idea? Absolutely not. All right. This is a fruit of the loom. It does not have care instructions on it, so I know that it is before 1960. All right. How can I repair this? What can I do? Because now I'm stuck with this beautiful vintage garment and I can't repair it. I can. I can do some repairs. It's torn on the bottom. What I can do is cut this off and use this fabric to tear the holes that are in there. And I did that. I'm going to show you how I did it. And you got to be ever so careful with this. And I just got to find that spot. Yeah, I did it so well, I can't even find it. How about that? No, that's not the way it works. All right, right here. Now this part is loose. I took something called Okay, it's called light. It's heat and bond, light sewable. Remember the term light. You don't want to add any weight to the clothing that you're doing. It looks like this. You can also use a light fusible interfacing. It should be double-sided interfacing, right? And it's got a glue on one side of it. I don't think you can see that really well because it's white on white. So, but you can feel it. There's a little bit of glue on one side of it. So what I did was first, I took a piece of white fabric, and this is very light fabric, cotton, and I interfused the interface with an iron, only held it on there two seconds, watched my setting, always start with the lightest. If it doesn't work, go to the darkest. And then after that, I let that cool, and then I put it on here, and then I fused it to this, and then I let it sit for a little bit. Okay, and this I'll trim off at the end. And then if you turn it around, where I fused it, actually right here, that way up there. Hold that. Turned out pretty good because you can you can you can't see it that much. It's right here. You can't even see. Okay, you can't see that tear anymore. So that is one way to do it. You may sew it. Now there's parts here where it came apart because I want to preserve this because obviously the original owners of the house this this was her dress. You can see a part here where it came apart at the same. This actually feels pretty stable to me, so I can just turn it under and hand sew this back together. All right, that I feel pretty comfortable doing. But um, we found that with a bunch of old newspapers in the walls of the closet. That was just that was just so much fun. Comes to flowers. Maybe you have a wedding bouquet that you're thinking of doing, or somebody's getting married and you want to preserve them. You can take them to someone, and $150 later, you have something like this. Ridiculously expensive, right? So what you can do is take some silica sand. All right, move this up on top of here so you can see it, what I'm doing. I'm just gonna do it like that. I had an excuse to go out and buy some fresh flowers now because I needed to show you this. So I'm gonna cut a flower here, taking this flower, Right here, I'm gonna stick it in the silica sand like this. Okay. Put it in there, stem, keep as much stem you want. And then what I'm gonna do is just sprinkle the sand on top of it and around it. And uh, carnations, uh, your more sturdy flowers are gonna work. Roses work quite well. I've done quite a few roses. Daisies work fine. They all work better with part of the stem. And as I do this, let's see what I'm doing there. Just sprinkling that on top, okay? And I just keep doing this very lightly. Now, 
that flower is perfectly covered. You notice you don't see the flower here. If you just keep it up. You want to cover it by about mm, half inch or so. Now I'm going to let this sit for two weeks. After two weeks, I take it out and it looks like a paper flower. If you've ever looked at paper flowers, and you can preserve those yourself, and then you buy fake stems. So you have to put the cover back on it when you're done. All right, you buy fake stems and you attach that to your flowers with that fake stem. And that's one way that you can save some money and you can preserve some flowers. Hey, maybe it's a homecoming flower. Maybe it was a prom corsage and you want to preserve that. Just buy that stuff in bulk and it lasts forever. It's good for you can reuse and reuse and reuse and reuse it. If it seems to start getting a little damp, just open it up. It's just sand. It's silica sand. Just let it dry out in between. And then it's good to go again. All right, let's go through one more thing. My grandfather made this lamp. He was a carpenter. Hey, it is beautiful. It's got inlaid ebony, heartwood, rosewood, black heart, all sorts of different types of wood in here. I use this lamp. All right, how do I preserve it? A lot of people like to do if there's chips in something, they use old English. It's okay. Just make sure you get the oil and don't overuse it because it does fill in the cracks. I'd rather see you do that than put some stain on it or for, by all means, don't put another coat of varnish on it. And my grandmother, every year or every two years, my dad said she would varnish the china cabinet. Just she'd slap another coat of varnish on it. And you can see it, my little sister has it because it's got like that much varnish on, on the outside of it. Uh, did we have it refinished? No, you don't want it. If you can, and if you watch the Antiques Roadshow, they always tell you don't refinish it. You can get away with it. So how do I clean this? Right? If I, I could have used lemon oil, but I'm just going to use a little furniture polish. Right? I'm going to let that sit on there just a little bit. And then I'm just going to rub it in. Okay. Do a nice rub job. Just making sure. Same way. You know, this is a little bit from dusting. Dusting is just getting the dust off. This is actually what I'm doing now is adding oil. Okay. I'm adding oil to the wood and shining it. And then you can see that just gives it a real nice buff. And I take that side of my cloth and I buff it. Okay, how often should you do this? You do not want to polish. You may dust your furniture every other day or every week. You do this once every two weeks because you don't want an oil buildup on the wood. And it will. It'll start to build up and it'll start to cake off. And how do I get the oil off? You have to use orange oil. This is how I do it because I clean houses and I was doing to someone's chair and rub and rub and rub and rub until it goes down. You cannot use vinegar on it. You don't want to ever use vinegar on wood because it will actually deteriorate the wood and it might leave a white stain on it. So you just want to make sure that you're oiling this and always keeping that wood moist because I wanted to, to uh, give this to one of my kids because it's absolutely beautiful. And, um, you know, if you have something like this that one of your grandparents or one of your ancestors made, you want to preserve that. Okay, there's a many other things that you're going to want to do. I'm just going to end it there, though. And then we're going to take this out of here. Let's see if I can have you see that again. All right. Take it out. And you can see. All right, that. Oh, and I can feel this. It's not, it has, it's only been a half an hour. But looking at this picture. Okay, it actually has relaxed a little bit. And I can feel it. I can feel that this picture is relaxing. All right. And if uh, another half an hour, another hour, I'll bet you anything I'm going to put it back in there, that that picture is going to be perfectly straight and it will be very pliable. So then very quickly, I'm going to get that blotting paper on top of it, put it between my parchment paper and then I'm going to, or archival paper, and then I'm going to let it sit for two weeks. And I'm not going to peek during those two weeks. You don't want to do that. Just leave it sit for two weeks. If you're really nervous and you're afraid that maybe the parchment paper is taking off, Oh my gosh, what if it's taking off some of the picture? Do a test picture first. You know, take a picture you have and roll it up and let it get all curled up and then and do it with that first. It's a little harder to do that with today's pictures because the paper is made of a different quality. It's made of a better quality to last longer. Older pictures, not so much, and the emulsion was different back then. So do a test one first and just to give yourself some peace of mind. And that is it. I could sit here and show you a ton of ways to do other stuff, but I know that we're out of time. So. I will hand it back to Katie.
Well, thanks so much, Angie. I, I learned a lot and you have so many cool things. I'm so jealous of all the cool uh, family heirlooms that you have and all the beautiful photos. Um, we did have a couple questions. Sure. Um, someone was wondering um, when you're talking about um, your plate, I think you had, and yeah. you said you had a gold rim. So yes. like, what if you have, what if you have glasses that have gold rims? How would you handle those? I would still oil them. I would try to oil below the gold rim. Actually, it's not going to hurt to put mineral oil on the gold. You can still do that. If, you, if you're using them, that's great. But I will, I will mention if you use glasses that have gold rims, that gold is going to wear off because it's usually gold plated. That's something that I probably wouldn't use. That's one type of glass I wouldn't use. I would just display as much as you'd want to. I would really just display that because I've seen way too many glasses with that gold rim just worn off around the top. Uh, but but by all means, still oil it, still keep it, you know, flexible and pliable. And you don't think of glasses being pliable, but it is. Yeah. So, yeah. And then someone was wondering about um, what if you wrap your um, china in paper and then put it in the china cabinet? Is that an okay way of preserving it? Sure. You can do that if you want to wrap it in paper and put it in a china cabinet. If you don't want it to show the paper, buy a box and uh, put it in the box. Archival box is best again, but if you just have a uh, a box, maybe that paper comes in, you know, for a, a reams of paper come in a box, that would be okay. If it's something that you use on a regular basis, that would be okay too. Just use good tissue paper. A lot of people buy blue tissue paper. I, you know, I'm afraid if that stuff gets wet, it's gonna die, the dye is gonna bleed off onto it. And my wedding dress, which I was gonna lug out of my closet and bring down here, cause I had that professionally preserved is done with blue paper. There is special blue tissue paper. Just don't go out to Dollar Tree and buy some regular blue tissue paper. You wanna make sure you've got the preservation stuff. You know, a dry cleaner would probably sell you some. Now I think about it, I don't see why not, but I think you could just use regular tissue paper. Just don't use newspaper between the plates because that's gonna dry out. Great. Um, someone says they have a hammered aluminum pitcher of their grandmother's, and it has a small pinhole in the bottom, which currently makes it unusable as a pitcher. Is there any way to repair and keep it food safe that you are aware of? There is a couple ways you can do that. Uh, number one would be to take it to a jeweler, and they will add a little bit of, of gold or even just silver or steel to it, and they'll meld that on there from the inside because it's certainly not something that you want to see on the outside. You can put epoxy on it yourself, but epoxy isn't really, you know, just a dab of it on the inside and that will seal it. But you'd have to, in order to get that to hold well, you'd have to scratch the silver first. I just don't want to see you do that. So I would I would really recommend having that professionally repaired. And I don't think it'll cost you that much as long as you're not using 100% silver and maybe they're just going to do it with uh, stainless steel or something like that. You know, I, I think it, it's not going to cost that much. Uh, do you have any recommendations for dealing with the musty smell on old photos that were stored in a basement? Yes, I do. And these photos did smell musty. <laughs> I do. What I do is before I straighten them out or generally sometimes maybe after, I'll take them outside and let them sit in the sun. And uh, just being very careful that it's not a really hot day, you know, drenching down, but just let them sit in the sun and the sun will take some of that musty smell off. Some people have stored them in baby powder. Ooh, I just, you know, I don't know. I, maybe you could set them on top of a bowl with some baby powder in it and let it seep up and seal that for a little bit. I've done that and that doesn't harm it because the, the smell from the regular baby powder. It would be a box just like we used for this. And then I'll maybe let it sit overnight and come back the next morning and pull it out. And it didn't do any damage to my photo. But again, I used a test photo. I always used a test one beforehand because I just I just don't want to take that chance of, you know, of ruining something. And I and these aren't even mine. These are my cousins. So I'm redoing them for me. He was kind enough to let me have them because I told him I'd fix them. So I conned him out of them for a little while. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, um, someone asked, what kind of sand was that to preserve the flowers? It is silica sand. It's actually, and you can buy it. If you go online, I bought mine from Amazon. Oh man, I hate to prevent, promote Amazon as much as I do because they're putting companies out of business. But uh, it's it's just like the catalog days, isn't it? But now we're using the computer instead of a catalog. It's it's the same thing. But it is, and mine came in a five pound bag. So I bought two five pound bags and it comes, it can come in as little as a one pound bag, but you really almost need at least five pounds. And five pounds isn't even really, unless you're using a very small container and doing it one flower at a time. And if you've got a whole bouquet, you need to do more than one flower. 
you're going to want to buy a couple bags because you need to cover that by a half an inch to an inch. All right, and you can layer your flowers one on top of the other too. Just make sure that there's, you know, a little bit of room on top of them before you do that. And you can set them next to each other in there. And I've preserved quite a few flowers that way. Yeah, and someone wrote in the chat about um, the smelly photos that their librarian daughter recommends kitty litter in a sealed box. So I, I didn't never learn that, that in library I, school, yeah. so I don't know. <laughs> I could see that working. I've never heard of it, but I I would experiment with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a great it, it idea. It can't hurt, yeah, yeah as long as yeah. you're not obviously putting the, the actual yeah. litter on the, the photos. You want to make sure to have it raised right. up, of course. Couldn't point, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> anybody watching on the East Coast. <laughs> Okay. Um, someone said, what would you use um, from smoke damage photos and books? That is a tougher one. Um, and I have uh, some in-laws that are heavy smokers. So when we got some things from them for my husband, um, it, it was it was a challenge. Again, I set them outside in the sun. If it was a book, I opened it up, tried to get the pages. If it was photos, I used those. There are special things you can buy uh, for, there's very few. When it comes to paper, it's just a matter of letting it sit out in the sun and letting the sun bleach that smell out of it. Or again, baby powder, put it on a rack like it is in here and then seal it up for a little while, right? And then um, you just be careful that the baby powder, because powder is meant to dry you, right? So you want to be careful. You know, I think I might, and I might experiment with this, try this, this floral sand. I think I might place a couple of pictures on top of that and seal it up and see if that sand would pull that you know, you wouldn't be able to use that sand then again for anything else, but to see if that would pull that smell out of those photos. Tobacco smoke is... Oh man, That's a tough it, one, yeah. It is. You know, you go in somebody's house and the walls are yellow, so it's just, yeah. it's really tough. But I, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. Absolutely. You know, and check online because that's one thing that I just delved a little bit into because I don't have a lot of things with that problem. And someone asked if, if baking soda would be an alternative to baby powder. I think I've I've seen that online as well, that people have used baking soda. So. They have. Again, put it on the bottom, set it on a rack, let it dry. Baking soda, again, tends to dry out. So just keep checking it a little bit more often than you would check the other ones just to make sure that you're not drying it out. And the smoke one, she said it was actually smoke from a from a fire, not from like cigarette smoke. So fire I would think it would be easier. Yeah, yeah that's easier, easier to get out. Yeah. Sun will kill that pretty quick because it's, it's little micro bacteria and things that actually gets in there. And so what the sun does is it's gonna kill that and it's gonna clean it. And so that's how I get clothes to baby clothes that smell moldy or something. I put them outside in the sun and it really does work. And, and you know, sometimes it took a week, but it really did work. So yeah. mothballs, put it in the sun. Someone said, what about charcoal? Activated charcoal. You know, the charcoal you get for a fish tank that you use in a fish tank, you can buy it activated charcoal. And sometimes it comes in a nice sealed mesh bag. I'll bet you that if you took the photo and if it's in that sealed mesh bag, that nice, real thick, dense mesh, you could probably place the photo right on top of that. And maybe even down, although again, experiment, maybe even, you know, photo side down. And I would not seal that. I would just put it in a bin, but I wouldn't seal the bin. I would just put it in the bin and let it sit there for a couple of days. And that should that should work. I don't yeah. know, I gotta, you know, that's a good idea. I'm gonna check Sometimes that you just need to experiment a little. You never know what's you gonna do. work. <laughs> yeah, so have a couple of photos you don't care about laying around or take a photo yeah. you don't care about and damage it yourself. Put it in water or let it soak or whatever. And then, yeah. then you got something to play around with. Um, someone had asked earlier about um, using buffered or unbuffered tissue paper for photos. And I I looked it up because I actually, I didn't realize that there yeah. were buffered and unbuffered. I didn't either. Um, I found a preservation blog um, that said you would want to use buffered for most photos. So it, um, I put the link that I found in there about buffered versus unbuffered and what you use buffered versus unbuffered tissue for as well. I'm reading the high school letter jacket. How should it be cleaned and stored? Yeah. Two ways. Uh, you don't want to wrap it in plastic. That's what everybody does, right? Oh, I'll put this sheet of plastic over it. Don't do that. I ever can't breathe. You can either take an old sheet and wrap it around and just pin it and, you know, and then hang it up from the sheet or I wouldn't hang it up again. What am I saying? Don't hang it up, but put it in with an old sheet or again, I would use the archival tissue paper to keep it the best. And I'm guessing it's going to be wool. So that's one that I would have to worry about pests with because pests love wool. So definitely not any place, not any place with carpeting. 
Okay, not any place, not any outer closet because that's gonna be more susceptible to pests coming in, ants and things like that. Just be really careful with that because leather jackets are so cool. I, I just, I think that's great that he has it. Yeah. Yeah, so I would definitely put that archival tissue paper in just a box uh, or archival box. If you, if you don't wanna get the archival box and again, go with a box that printer paper comes in and use that one and just line it with muslin. And then um, kind of a similar one, someone said that they have two children's embroidered bomber type jackets that were brought back from Korea during the Korean War. How mm -hmm. would I find out if these are valuable or just old clothes? <laughs> They're bomber jackets. Do they have, if they have insignia on them or anything like that, they probably are valuable because Korean War stuff is pretty, pretty collectible these days. So you would probably look online. I would look it up online. You know, you can Get a photo search app online, search by image it's called. Take a picture of it and then do the search by image and it'll come up. Or if you have an Army, Navy uh, surplus store, those are few and far between these days. They used to be pretty, pretty handy. Or take it to a, a recruiter, an Army recruiter. There might be somebody there who actually knows a little bit more about it, but I would probably do the search by image first. And then I would go to an Army, Navy store and ask them, hey, because they, they have vintage stuff. You, yeah. you know what this is? You know, play really or dumb. I wonder, um, like um, a veterans museum. So we have the Wisconsin Veterans yeah. Museum in yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. Obviously, I, I don't know if yours is a Wisconsin veteran um, that served in the Korean War, but they would be able to direct you um, on where you might be able to research those types of clothing um, or direct you to resources that might help you to be able to find out what value um, that might be. They did, because I wrote to them once about my uncle's photo album. I didn't know what to do with it, his military one, and they said they would take it. So I know they have quite the collection. So they yeah. can, they probably would be really impressed looking at that too. They'd have a good time because I have my dad's, a Korean knife that my dad had in the war. So yeah. Um, someone's wondering if you're aware of any national stored services for photos that have temperature and humidity control. I personally am not aware of any that there would are be able to, to have. Yeah. It paid for, unfortunately. Pay if for you can it, find one, you let me know because there yeah. are none. I could, <laughs> I could not find one. So you're, you're going to have to, digit. First of all, digitally preserve them, and then preserve the rest of them yourself. I mean, then yeah. do it yourself. There's just, there's just nobody. There's not much of a market for it, so nobody wants to go into that. You know that they probably would lose money. Yeah, and space, is, especially space, you know, if you think about the rent for an apartment or the rent for a house, you know, just yeah. think about renting a, a facility like that and, you know, not even having it be livable, you know, you having storage and storage and storage, it's it's probably not cost effective for them to do that. No, and then people will just maybe forget about it or pass away and nobody comes to claim it yeah. and now they're stuck or with stop all paying photos. for it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how many times do you go to Rummage Town and see old photos? Who's that? We don't know. It was in the house when we yeah. bought it. So, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, the best way is going to be, and I, I like cloud storage, but I'm not, it's not my number one choice because if something never happens to the internet and someday I think it's going to, maybe, maybe not, you lost everything. Everything yeah. you've got stored in the cloud is gone. You can't get it. I always do the three, yeah. two, one backup, three copies, two different yep. mediums, yep. one offsite. That's Smart uh, the rule that I is. follow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a good rule too. If you've got those negatives, man, start to restore those right away because those are gold. Uh, they were the best form of photo storage there is, especially those glass ones. Yeah. They're just so cool to look at. Yeah, uh, hard right. to find. Extremely Our hard. next question, um, someone said they're working on a museum display window. They want to oh. hang a men's suit and a women's dress on the back wall of the display window. How would we go about hanging these to protect the items because they're going to be a permanent installation? They're asking, you know, if there's a certain type of hanger they should use yeah. or how them on a wall or any suggestions that you might have for I would museums. definitely um the type of hanger you're going to use there's two types of hangers one has broad it's it's this that thick on the top instead of just being a thin wire it's actually that thick so it kind of looks like that and it's meant to make it look as if somebody's actually in if you can get a mannequin I don't know if it's in a store you don't have room for a mannequin but if you can get a mannequin that's going to be your best way Otherwise, use a heavily padded hanger. Maybe you've seen these. They used to be perfumed years ago. They're silk. They have the little rubber handle, and then they've got, you know, hold on. I might have one in the closet here. Just hold on. That's not going to be a bad way to do it. Oh. Nope. Those are all in my upstairs closet, but I do have several of them. But you want to make sure that whatever you hang it on, 
it's going to be heavily padded. And then every once in a while, I would just kind of take it off the hanger and because if it's a permanent display, check it and make sure that there's no, you know, no stress being added up here. But if it's padded and if it's not real heavy, if it's really heavy, that's when you have to be careful because the pull on the fabric is going to create that stress on the seams. Although old, let's face it, clothes that were made years ago were made far better than they are today. That, yes. Correct? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So a mannequin is going to be your best bet because it drapes it over and it supports it all the way down. If you can't do that, then I would use the padded hanger and the suit. How would you hang it? I would put a hook in the top of the ceiling and I would hang it that way simply because it's going to breathe that way. I went to the white Christmas display. They had an Oshkosh this year and they had the actual dresses the girls wore in that number sisters, sisters. Remember that one? I and don't. they had the dresses, but they displayed them on mannequins. In fact, every outfit they had there was displayed on a mannequin. Wow. Um, just because it, they were pretty faded, but as far as the seams and stuff go and the fabric, they were in mint condition. I was really amazed. Yeah. Yeah. And when uh, I'm not sure what type of museum that person's going to display those in, but I would think that the staff at the museum too would also be knowledgeable or, or contact your local museums and and ask how they you know showcase their things, especially for yeah. their permanent exhibits. And I'm they're sure going to be use, the experts. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll use museum glass, I'm sure too. Yeah. You know, to keep the sunlight away from it, make sure it's not going to be in direct light. And they're, they'll be really good about that. Yeah. Right. The only thing you okay. Um, our next question, um, this person said they have many old photos from a photo studio. With the photos are flat, and since they've been in cardboard, they've been in cardboard folders um, that they came in. Is there anything special that they should be doing to preserve them? If they're in the original cardboard folders, check the folders. I'm not a big fan of cardboard storage. Yeah, the I'm going to guess those aren't archival folders, probably. I but mean, No, they're, they've got acid in them, so I would take yeah. them as much as they look nice in that folder, I would take them out. I, I've taken all mine out and I store them in archival photo albums. And I did want to mention that album that I got was this one right here. Uh, I wouldn't usually not get leather because I'm kind of like I'm animal friendly and stuff like that. But uh, this thing was $20. Okay. So just, just so you have kind of a, an idea of how much those photo albums cost. It seems like, oh, but that's going to be so much money again you're not going to regret it because you those are your photos that's your history you're going to have that forever so take it out of there you can keep the the cardboard you know and you if you want to store it in the cardboard maybe it's glued and you can't take it out then put the whole thing in an archival sleeve and that'll that'll still be okay yeah you know you'll yeah. still if you can't get it out get it out if you can't or you don't want to then just put the whole thing in a sleeve and do it that way i've done that too because yeah. that's archival stuff is not cheap but no. You want to spend the money to preserve your stuff and, and for future generations. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it hurts the wallet, but you'd rather be safe than sorry than in saving, you know, don't, you know, save money by, you know, putting it yeah. in a plastic bin or something, you know, buy the archival stuff and, and you know, make it worth it to, to yeah. preserve that stuff. Buy your groceries at Aldi's for a couple of months so you can save that money and buy <laughs> those, you know, Aldi's is a good place anyways, but... Yeah. You know, cut corners on something else just so you can find that extra money. But like Katie said, you won't regret it. Yeah. Yeah, That's those are your treasures. Those are your, and I always say, keep an heirloom if it has memories. If there's a story behind it, type the story up, stick it somewhere with the heirloom. Yes. Yeah. A clothing is a piece of clothing. A dish is a dish. A glass is a glass. You know, a piece of jewelry is a piece of jewelry, but it's the memory behind it. This is my great-grandmother. She got it. Uh, this is how she got engaged. This is when she got engaged. Keep all that with it because that's what makes all these mementos worth something. You know, that's why I, I generally don't collect antiques unless they were relatives or something because yeah, they have they meaning. Mean something to me. Yeah. yeah. That's that's when it makes it really special. Yeah. Uh, so you know what I didn't check? Go ahead. Real oh, quick yeah. record albums that smell moldy because we all start them in the basement. Oh, sure. You can put those outside and you can actually sprinkle a little baby powder on the covers of those. Watch them really closely outside, though, because they will melt in the sun. So just be very careful about that. Um, someone's wondering if you can use the, the same method um, with the rolled photos, if you could use it for an oversized photo. And I'm guessing you could. You just yeah. need to make sure your, your container is big enough to accommodate that. And, of course, you know, making sure you have that wire rack that, you know, that photo is not going to be touching that water. Buy an under-the-bed box. You know those boxes? You yeah. Get to, yeah. Yeah, use that. That'll work. 
Yeah, absolutely. I just saw somebody said if they could use it to polish an old trophy. If it's solid silver, anything that's silver plated or gold plated, got to be careful because if you polish it, you're probably going to take the plating right off. Um, gold plated, the plating eventually is going to wear off. But for a trophy, if it's solid silver, yeah, because that's what that one from my high school was that it was solid silver. So I just, and I have to go back there every year and polish it because the thing just keeps, it's going to keep tarnishing. And it's like I said, it's the sulfur in the air that reacts with the silver that tarnishes it or the brass. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, and back to the rolled stuff. So someone says they have old baptismal and confirmation documents that were stored rolled up. Is Would you use that same process as you do for photos? Yeah. Yeah. Being uh, The paper on that is going to be a little bit thinner. So I would check those more often, but you can do that with a photo. You also want to see how the ink is because the ink on there, you just want to make sure it doesn't get damp because you don't want that yeah. ink to bleed. But Try, you know what? Write yourself something by hand. Put it in that chamber. See what happens. You know, yeah. curl up. See, leave it in there for a couple hours and then look at it and go, oh, the ink blurred or whatever. Then you know you can't do it. Because there's different types of ink. Some of the older inks are pretty stable, but some of the other types of inks bleed pretty readily, especially if it's a felt pen or something they used. That's not going to stay very long. It'll it'll bleed right away. Yeah. I, I have um, some old baptism um, rolled ones too. And what I did was I actually, I brought them to a framer and they, you know, ended up framing them. And I know they were able to get them flat and then frame them in archival glass, of course, because if yeah. I do yeah. want to display them eventually in my house, you don't want the sunlight to damage those. But that's another option for, for getting them unrolled and, you know, making sure that they stayed fl stay flat is to frame them. Yeah, that is an excellent idea. Yeah, framing them is the best way. And then just don't put them across from the window. Yeah. Make sure and don't buy one of those little lights that shines on it either. You don't need to be shining light on it just because that's again, even with museum glass, that's going to uh, probably wreck the picture. And I wouldn't try to frame it yourself. You want to make sure it's professionally done. You know, you can damage things more. Again, it's going to cost a little bit more, obviously, to get it professionally framed, but they are the experts. They're going to be able to do it and do it beautifully and make sure that you, you know, don't have any damage to that beautiful heirloom that you don't want to lose, of course. Sometimes it costs you more for the, have a print frame, more for the framing than it does for the print. But, yeah. But that's because they use all those, you know, that stuff in it. That stuff isn't cheap, like we yeah. said. What, I saw somebody that asked if they could polish something. I forgot. Oh, wood carvings. Yes. Oil them. Just like I, I did that lamp. Oil them or take a polish. Like this is just a simple, um, it's just a simple wood cleaner and polish. I wouldn't, I would go without the cleaner. I couldn't get out my lemon oil. I would go without the cleaner part. I would just get the polish part or use lemon oil. Okay. That's, that's the way I would do it. Yeah. Just give them a very light coating and then buff it to get all the excess oil off it and just do that. It's a carving maybe, I don't know, once a month or just when you notice it's starting to get a little bit dull. But wood dries out really quick. Think of all the stuff you know of wood that's got cracks in it. Yeah. It dries out fast. So, yeah, especially if you're not, if it's not in a humidity controlled area. And you don't want to store that stuff in the closet. You want to put it out where people can see it. Yeah. Yeah. This room that I'm sitting in has a lot of my um things that my aunts or uncles or because they knew I was the family historian. So, like, oh, here, why don't you take mm -hmm. this? So, yeah, I'm blessed, very blessed that way. Yes. So yeah, I don't um, have the China or stuff, but I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> someone says, when would you use the muslin? Um, what would what would you wash it with before you store it? Mild dish soap again, or or you can get what's called soap flakes for washing baby clothes in. I think it's called baby soft or something like that. And not in a machine. I would soak it in the sink, you know, and I would let it soak rather than, you know, doing the turn thing and the rubbing thing. I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything like that. If you need to spot clean something, then put a little soap maybe directly onto that spot and clean it and then rinse it off really well. Uh, some people like to use distilled water to rinse it off with because the water that comes from out of our faucet has a lot of chemicals in it. That's up to you. Soft water has salt in it. I don't know if I would want to use soft water. I would probably go out and purchase some distilled water just to rinse it in. I would rinse it in distilled water. Um, if you've got a dehumidifier down your basement you could use that but make sure you filter it because it's usually going to catch a lot of dirt in there too make sure that when you pour out the distilled water you're not seeing anything floating in there you know pour it through a towel or something so you can get all the impurities out and you, you could use that distilled water to do it so yeah just very gently dish soap like dawn i wouldn't use because it's got degreaser in it so but i would go out and buy those baby flakes for 
you know, cleaning baby clothing. They're really, really gentle. Uh, make sure it's a seventh generation would be another good brand to use. I think Nine Elements is another brand. There's a couple of those environmentally friendly brands out there that are good to use. Um, someone's wondering about um, the process for scanning oversized photos. That And that was the one I went over. If you have an oversized photo, you can either take it to professional or you scan it in pieces and you overlap the portions that you fold. So if I have two photos here, where did my bag of photos go? Right here. And I take these. Okay, so let's say this is this is um one. Uh, it's hard because I get the glare off these. This is one photo. That's my aunt ice fishing. She was a great fisherwoman. Holy cow! Um, she lived on the ice. So I would photo this section first, and then maybe I'd I'd photo that section. But while I'm doing it, I would overlap. So I would photo from here to here, and then the next one I would overlap and photo from here to the edge. So you're always overlapping a little piece. Then look for a photo stitching app is what it's called and download it. Uh, you can you can get them for free. I'm not sure. I think you can. The best ones are, the, of course, going to be the ones you pay for. They're only 30 bucks, something like that, 20, 30 bucks, which seems like a lot, but not really if you've got a lot of photos to do. And it will follow the instructions they give you and you can stitch that photo back together and you'll never know that it was a bunch of photos taken separately. And it just like blends it together like that. It works really well and it's not hard to do either. It's fairly easy. Yeah. That's what it I would recommend. It also depends on the size of the photo. Like I yeah. know at the library, like our, we have a copy machine that is a scanner as well. And it, I think the biggest it does is like 11 by 24 or something like that, or yeah. 11 by 17. Um, and we do, you know, have the ability to scan it at a high resolution, like 600 DPI. So that's, you know, something that you might be able to bring it to your local library or, you know, a local Photoshop yeah. and, and get it scanned in because they might have a larger scanner than the ones that you might be able to buy um, for your own personal use. Yeah, because even the ones that, you, even if you have a big scanner for personal use, there are photos that are going to be so big that you're not going to be able to capture every area on there without destroying the photo. So, like here in town, I would go to Shooting Star and they would, you know, they've got these big, huge machines they can put it on. Never photocopy a photo. Damage it that way. The light from a photocopier can damage a photo. You notice if you go into historical libraries or research libraries, we have one here in, in uh, Green Bay and Oshkosh. They do not let you photocopy the documents. The first time I went there, they did. And I looked at them and I said, are you sure you want me to do this? And she goes, yeah, go ahead. I said, shouldn't I be wearing gloves? And she went, no, now they don't let you do it. Now they require, they don't even let you handle the documents anymore. They'll take it out, but you have to have gloves on to look at it. Do photocopy places have archival paper? They might. They might. Uh, it's highly unlikely, but they might. Yeah. Uh, I, like I said, I know the places around here I looked at, I think Office Depot was the only one that had some, but I didn't have a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it depends, yeah, if it's kind of a local shop or, you know, what kind of business they get, or it might be something that they get special order for you. Yeah. Um, it really, it depends. It's going to vary based on where you are and what place you're know, going. Uncurling? Yeah. A little bit longer, you know, so that's uncurling. Um, and, you know, the reason, again, the reason they don't stock it is because they don't have a high call for it. They're not mm -hmm. going to put something on their shelves if nobody wants it. And I did leave one of those in there too long. In fact, this is the one. That's why I purposely kept this one. See that little blue stuff right up here? That's what happens if you leave it in that humidification chamber too long. It got too moist. And that's what happened. The emulsion started to turn blue. So watch these. Mm -hmm. Watch them and make sure they don't leave them too long. I would, an hour, hour to start, two hours at the most. All right. Um, someone's wondering what they should do with a cedar chest. So she said, items in the chest get brown spots. So what do you think about painting the inside with a poly kind of paint to prevent that from happening? No, I wouldn't do that because a, the, a cedar chest actually does store stuff. I'm surprised they get brown spots. What you might have to do, and I've seen this done, is take everything out and just lightly sand the inside of the cedar box again to re-release re that cedar the preserving qualities of it, because sometimes it dries up on the outside. We had to do that at my son's house. He's got a cedar closet, lucky bugger. So we had to lightly sand the whole inside of the closet. Because we walked in, I said, I don't smell any cedar. Do you smell any cedar? But it was so old. This house is 120 years old that, you know, and at the time it was unusual to have a cedar closet. So we lightly sanded it and released those oils back into the air. If you're still getting things in a cedar chest, 
I would probably preserve them between some muslin or something maybe, or again, some archival tissue paper inside mm -hmm. the cedar chest, and that should take care of that for you. Yeah, I've never heard of that before, though, so that's that's really interesting. I'm going to have to research that. Um, yeah. Someone's wondering what you would do with pictures in a curved glass. How would you preserve those? If you can get them out of the glass? Is, is it, I wonder, if it's sometimes the picture's printed right on the glass, sometimes it's just a flat back and the glass is curved, which, in which case, it, as long as it's sealed properly, they are preserved. As long as it's, you know, it's it's sealed within the glass properly. They are preserved. I probably take it to a, a place that frames and ask them. I really would. I would go with a, a professional on that and say, hey, is this the best way for me to store this photo? Because I had one of those and I took it out. I took out the photo and I kind of touched it up and stuff and then I put it back in, but I haven't sealed it yet because I'm going to take it somewhere for someone to seal it for me. Because sometimes they'll do a vacuum and they will pull that air out. Uh, it's hard to find somebody who will do that though. Yeah, but as I'm long sure as the photo is <laughs> yeah, 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 you're talking probably send away, and I'm always leery about sending stuff away. But um, like I said, I sent all those photos back, and it was so much fun to get them back digitized because they were all negatives. So I sent all the negatives, and they were slides. This place did slides, and I hadn't seen these slides ever. Some of them. So when they came back, I oh my gosh, I was almost in tears. I was having so much fun going through those pictures. Yeah. It's like, did I really wear that dress? But, you know, it was just, it was just fun. Yeah. So def even if you have slides, again, that's another one of the best ways to preserve photos because that's basically a negative. So yeah. you want to keep those in a separate box. I have a slide box I keep them in. Um, similar question to what we answered earlier, but what someone's wondering about how you get a musty smell out of wool hats. So instead of photos, um, what about clothing? Put it outside in the sunlight um, again. Put it in the, what did the other members say? To use activated charcoal. Maybe set it on a rack above the activated charcoal. And musty stuff in clothing, again, is microorganisms that have settled in there. And that's how that musty smell gets in there. It's damp. It's actually mold. It's a little bit of mold. That's what the must is, which is a microorganism mold. So the, the activated charcoal should kill that mold for you, same as the sunlight will kill it. But now with clothing, you put it out in the sunlight, it could fade. Right, so that's so that's something that you got to kind of be careful of. So I would even just put it outside in the shade, just the fresh air might do it. But I with that one, I think I might go with the activated charcoal on top of a rack because I it, sun kills the shade isn't gonna. You're just getting the fresh air, but that could take months and months and months. Boy, that works. Yeah. Someone was asking about blueprints too. If if um, you have a way to preserve those that you're aware of, I think that preservation blog that I saw earlier had mentioned blueprints. Maybe I think that's yes. where you would use a buffered box or an unbuffered box. Let me yep, see. Yep, you can put them in a box. Put sheets of archival tissue paper in between the blueprints. Uh, along with my son's house, they found the original blueprints for the landscaping. Oh my gosh, is that cool? Unbuffered so, boxes. Yeah. That's what it yep. or unbuffered tissue paper. Is. Yes. What you should use for blueprints. And I have that link again that I throw in the chat. Oh, good. Is the chat saved along with the with the presentation? It is. And I can it, email okay. it out to people. Okay. That's and our great. Post our handout again for you if you joined us late and missed it. And I can um, make another handout that includes all the things I did that aren't on mine. If you want me to make another one, I can throw that out there, throw it to Katie, and she can send it out too or put it on a on a link. I think those were all the questions I saw, unless uh, there's any last minute questions. Uh, thank you again, Angie. Wonderful thank expertise. Um, someone said they meant a blueprint place to scan large photos. Um, oh, yeah. You can take it to an architect's office. Yeah, they they have yeah. large scanners there. Yeah, I don't know. I have never done that. I used to actually, I used to scan architectural. I used to scan blueprints for people. Yeah, I worked at a place. But I know that they they can do it. So some of them can. Some of the newer machines are right from the computer to the printer. So they might not be able to. But boy, if I bet you they could tell you who could. Yeah. And again, the eye memories, places like that, if you send it to them, they will. All right. Um, someone asked, does the ketchup work on brass? Yes, it yep. does. Yep. And then for wrapping in muslin, do you wash the muslin first? Yeah. I would. Yeah, because they, they put a preservative chemical on that before it goes to the fabric store. You know, just the chemicals for making it, you want to get those off there. And what would you so wash, wash it in? Again, that baby, that soap, that really gentle soap. Woolite is a really good one to use. I mean, and you can throw it in the washing machine. You don't have to hand wash that. But woolite, just 
not you know not era or tide or not anything like that yeah. it's got to be really gentle the method cleaning i use a I use that. I use an environmentally safe at element nine, and then I've used method. Any of those are fine to wash it in and let it air dry. Don't throw it in the dryer. Hang it outside if you can. It's great. Yeah. Lesson the evil in Alaska. That's probably not going to work for you. Yeah. For the Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. You might not be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think, again, those are um, the last questions we had, unless uh, people have any last minute ones. Again, I want to thank you, Angie, for your time and your expertise and all your knowledge. Um, again, um, mark your calendars for our next Find Your Ancestors session. It's going to be Saturday, May 20th at 2 p.m. Central, and that's going to be on tracing your Jewish family history. Um, so please join us. There's the link in the chat to, to, for that, as well as in the handout. Um, again, we are also doing a Appleton Locks walking tour on Thursday, May 18th at 6 p.m. where um, that's an actual walking tour. We'll be walking from Lock 4 to Lock 1 in Appleton and learning about the history of the, the Fox River and the Appleton Lock system. If you didn't want to walk, we do have a virtual option that we'll be doing on Wednesday, June 7th at 2 p.m. Central. We're also going to record that one, and that one is going to be um, virtual on Zoom, and so you'd need to register for that one, whereas if um, you do the walking tour, you don't need to register for that walking tour. Again, the details on those are in the handout, as well as um, our future, ancest future, future Find Your Ancestors programs are going to be on our events calendar, as well as in the handout. So I think that's it for today and um, everybody enjoy your afternoon and hopefully you have some good weather to enjoy yeah katie and i are going to go run outside now yes before it starts to rain and then snow that's, <laughs> yeah that's right yeah that's right or snow yeah yeah okay right. thank you so much everyone bye-bye take care everyone thank you yeah bye